And uh, I chose this topic because of a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine on February 2nd of this year, which was celebrating the 200th year of publication of that weekly medical journal from 1812 to 2012. It comes out every week and is the preeminent medical journal for family practice, internist, general medicine in this country. It's very similar to what the English had in the Lancet. But the Lancet didn't begin publishing until nine years later in 1823. And the the New England Journal is sponsored and owned by the Massachusetts Medical Society. The author of the article was Dr. Anthony S. Foss, and he's the director of allergy and infectious disease uh, at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C. He has been a, the director since 1984, and he's a renowned physician for his work on malaria, tuberculosis, influenza, and especially with the HIV virus and the AIDS worldwide pandemic. HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus, and AID is the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Now, physicians are great for taking long words and putting them into the alphabet and then just using the alphabet. Uh, to describe it, which is very confusing much of the time. And we're going to begin by talking about great pandemics that have occurred in the world. The first the big one that we know about is the bubonic pneumonic plague that scourged the whole populations in Europe in the 14th century. And of course, at that time, there was no diagnosis, no treatment. And so they, uh, but they did feel or understand that the disease was caused by rodents who were carrying a bacteria that caused tularemia. And the only thing they could do was to burn down sections of towns and villages to eliminate the rodents. And uh, we, we're all old enough to either have lived through or remember the influenza pneumonia pandemic of 1918-1920. That killed 50 million people worldwide. And this uh, pandemic was known as the Spanish flu. It was, it was not, it did not begin in Spain, but it was called the Spanish flu because of the extreme severity of the disease in that country, which killed many, many adolescents and young people. Now, influenza in itself can kill. But in that pandemic, the cause of death for most people was secondary bacterial infection on top of the influenza virus. The influenza virus damaged the lungs, the secondary bacterial infection carried them away. Now, in our time, uh, you can remember the annual summertime appearance of polio myelitis in our local communities. And of course, all of that passed away with the salt vaccine for the polio virus. The onset of infectious disease in an otherwise healthy individual is usually abrupt and unmistakable. In the absence of a specific treatment, acute infectious diseases often pose an all or nothing situation with the person quickly dying or recovering spontaneously, and then usually having a subsequent lifelong immunity to that particular organism. A couple of examples. In the early days of our childhood, before the advent of antibiotics, if a neighbor developed pneumonia, the house was put under quarantine, and a sign was nailed to the front of the house warning people not to go in there. The extended family and the neighbors gathered on the seventh day because the person either lived or died on that day. And that was called the crisis. And that was typical of the pneumococcal pneumonia. 
Now, uh, talk about a bit about children's diseases. German measles, which is rubella, or the ordinary measles, which is rubiola, chicken pox, mumps, whooping cough, which is pertussis. Well, these diseases were often benign, and most children survived. There still was a significant number of fatalities. But if one was so unfortunate as to contact this disease as an adult, the percentage of fatalities was quite high. Chickenpox virus can lie dormant in the dorsal gang ganglion in the spinal cord and may appear much later in life as shingles. Uh, it can be there for decades and then pop out as an acute case of the shingles. Even the shingles vaccine does not give complete immunity to this particular problem. Chickenpox in children is usually, but not always, a pretty simple disease with low mortality. But a case of chickenpox pneumonia in an adult is a very serious proposition with significant mortality prior to the time when we develop antiviral agents. In our day, uh, immunization given in infancy and early childhood has obviated all of these risks. Infectious diseases are transmissible from one person to another person. This is unique among human diseases, and the transmission can occur by inoculation into any of the body's orifices, eyes, nose, mouth, ears, lungs, whatever. And it can be picked up either on or under the skin. Uh, it is, can be airborne or food and waterborne. Most infectious diseases are caused by a single agent, one. Tests can be done to identify this agent, and then appropriate antibiotic or antiviral agents are tested in the laboratory to determine which therapy is most effective to eradicate that particular microorganism. Public health measures such as sanitation or chemical disinfection, hand washing and vector control and vaccination can be instituted. As preventive measures have become more effective and efficient, and if there is no non-human host or major reservoir, certain infectious diseases can be eliminated entirely, and globally, such as smallpox, and in the Western Hemisphere, polio biologics, not so in Africa and Asia. Infectious pathogens have an extraordinary ability to mutate and replicate against the antibiotic and antiviral agents and develop resistance to these agents, resulting in a back and forth struggle between human ingenuity to develop new agents and vaccines and constant microbial adaptation. Now let's talk about a minute and we'll talk about the influenza vaccine that we get in the late latter part of each year in October and November. Early in the year, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, they studied the incidence and the variety and the virulence of the influenza virus variations that caused major incidents of flu in the previous fall and winter around the world. They then picked out three varieties of the flu virus, and the manufacturers take six months to make this vaccine. Generally, there are two types. There are two A's and one B. The influenza A virus, the influenza B virus, the different variations. And they pick out two A's and one B. It takes six months to make up the vaccine, and we all get it later in the year. Now, this is required because the virus and viruses continue to mutate and change, and the scientists have to work out which vaccine is most likely to protect us. I think we're all fortunate that we have these scientists and, and the CDC in Atlanta to do this job for us. Every person has his own unique immune system that protects and defends the body's integrity against forms or dangerous cells or substances that attempt to invade it. The invaders could be bacteria or fungi or parasites, cancer cells, any foreign substance that the body perceives as dangerous or non-self. The immune system distinguishes between self and what is foreign or non-self and fights to reject anything that is non-self. 
We immunize our children extensively to avoid childhood diseases. But when we were young, we were exposed to a lot of things that the children nowadays are not. We played in the dirt and the mud, we swam in the rivers and the ponds and the lakes. We build up our communities by being exposed to the dangers. Evolution over the centuries and our inherited genes give us our immunity. We reduce this risk by immunization of our children and ourselves. That's very good philosophy, very good treatment, works out just fine, except that now we have a segment of the population that believes childhood immunization is a cause for autism. And those families with autism, which is a problem which is rising in frequency in the population, uh, bothers these people such that they will take anything that's said and to try to help to help them not have children with this problem. So they refuse to have their children immunized. And what that does is that brings these childhood diseases back into our schools. And it's not uh, uncommon at all to read in the papers about four, five, six dozen cases of a particular childhood disease in a school. Now, Dr. Fossey in his article gives an historical perspective describing the life during George Washington's era. George Washington died of an acute infectious disease, bacterial epiglottitis. Now, the epiglottitis is a small structure in the back of your throat which works like a flapper lid. And when you swallow, your, your epiglottis folds down over your trachea so food and fluid and whatever you're swallowing in your mouth does not go into your lungs but goes down into your <clears throat> esophagus and then into your stomach. Washington was born in 1732, just before the deadliest diphtheria epidemic on the North American continent. I went to medical school, graduated in 1952. I worked in large and small community hospitals. I worked for two years in the service. I worked for 40 years in Los Angeles. I have never seen a case of diphtheria. And I think that's because of the immunization that you give it in child. Now, George Washington was uh, scarred by smallpox. He survived several bouts of malaria. He suffered from wound infections and abscesses. He nursed his brother as he died from tuberculosis. And he even had an influenza epidemic named after him, the Washington Influenza of 1789-1790. During his presidency, he resided in the capital city of Philadelphia, even after most of the government fled from that city because of the nation's deadliest yellow fever epidemic. During Washington's time, there was no concept of infection or immunity, no vaccines, no specific or effective treatment of infectious disease, and little recognition that any treatment or public health measure could reliably control epidemic disease. Microscopes were not developed until the 1830s and 40s. And it took about until 1890 for Dr. Robert Koch to discover anthrax as the first fully characterized infectious disease. He was the first one to establish causality by publishing Koch's postulates, which are on the front of that page that I gave you. Let's take a look at those. These are, these are interesting. And I wrote them out because it's much easier to understand them when you see them than it is to hear them. But anyway, Heinrich Hermann Robert Koch, born in 1843, died in 1910. He was a German physician, the father of microbiology. He isolated anthrax bacillus, tuberculosis, and cholera organisms, and he won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1905. He published Koch's postulates for establishing an organism that causes infectious disease in 1890. Before we get into that, let me just mention about anthrax. Anthrax is a bacterial disease of grazing animals, particularly cows, sheep, deer, uh, any animal that eat, eats grass. And the human form of this anthrax can affect the skin or the intestines or the lungs. And Dr. Koch developed a vaccine for livestock in 1880. 
first one that was successful. The last outbreak of Anthrax was in 1979 in Russia, which caused 68 deaths after the inhalation of anthrax spores from a biological weapons facility in Sverdslov. Now, we all see in the paper or on the television occasionally where some political person or prominent individual receives an envelope in the mail with a white powder. And that white powder is always thought maybe that's anthrax spores. So that gets involved the anti-terrorists and the FBI and all the rest. But anthrax is a terrible disease uh, which can kill quickly and, 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 and with great suffering on the part of the patient. So it's something to be avoided. But anyway, let's go through this now. Microorganism, number one, microorganism must be found in abundance in all organisms. The word organism here replies, replies to any living being, humans, animals, birds, fish, insects, all kinds of things. But they, they chose the word organisms and so we leave it in the original form. Microorganism must be found in abundance in, in all organisms suffering from disease, but not in healthy organisms. Much later, it was found not to be true in typhoid, cholera, and tuberculosis. Let's stop for a minute. Who's heard of typhoid Mary? The wolf should be old enough for typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary was a name given to Mary Mallon. She emigrated from Ireland in 1884 and became a cook in New York City to several different households in succession. At each location, sooner or later, there was an outbreak of typhoid fever. It was then theorized that a seemingly healthy person could be a carrier of the disease. In other words, you could harbor the organism in your body but not be sick. And this was Mary. Mary was quarantined for several years, but finally she was released. She changed her name, went to work as a laundress. But, but later, she, in 1915, she again became a cook, this time at the Sloan Hospital for Women in New York City. 25 people were infected and one died, and Mary was placed in quarantine for the rest of her life. Poor Mary. <laughs> But this is true, uh, particularly of these diseases, typhoid, cholera, and tuberculosis. Lots and lots of people carry tuberculosis around with them that are not sick, and are not going to die of it, but they certainly can spread it around. And the same thing with the cholera. All right, number two, the microorganism must be isolated from the diseased person and grown in a pure culture. Number three, the microorganism should cause disease when inoculated into a healthy organism. That would be a laboratory animal, usually mice or rats. Again, cholera and tuberculosis can be found in healthy persons who have a good immune system. The microorganism must be re-isolated from the inoculated diseased experimental animal and identified as being identical to the original specific causative agent. When you look at these things, they all fit this common sense. But for Robert Cope, this was a remarkable discovery, sufficient to give him the Nobel Prize for Medicine. All right. Now, in the last 50 years, vaccine production and many technological advances in the formulation, production, and distribution of the public have led to dramatic changes in public health disease prevention. The World Health Organization now estimates that each year 120 different types of vaccine save two and a half million lives, and if the vaccine could be used optimally, an additional two million more could be saved. Let's talk a little bit about treatment. Successful treatment of infectious disease began in 1910 when a Dr. Ehrlich started treating syphilis with his magic bullet, bullet arsphenamine or salversan. Sulfa drugs were developed in 1936, penicillin in 1943. Tuberculosis required multiple antibiotics, and in the 1950s, the, the, the control of tuberculosis was so good that the TB sanitariums began to empty and became other kinds of institutions. 
early antivirals began in the 1960s and reached their peak in the 1990s because of the HIV AIDS worldwide pandemic. All antibiotics and antivirals share an inherent weakness. The organisms against which they are directed are capable of developing mechanisms of resistance to the drugs, and they evolve, evolve new forms by mutation. This is the reason for picking the most prevalent flu to develop a vaccine for the coming year. In the field of public health, clean water and basic sanitation and hygiene prevent a great number of infectious diseases. The ability to treat infections effectively limits or prevents spread of the disease to others. In the 1980s, smallpox was eliminated from the world. Poliomyelitis had been eliminated from the Western Hemisphere. Malaria and tuberculosis are being actively treated and eliminated in some parts of the world. Now there's a couple of chronic diseases that once were attributed to host or environmental or lifestyle factors that are actually directly or indirectly caused by infection that can be controlled by prevention or treatment. Certain forms of liver cancer and liver cirrhosis that are caused by hepatitis B and C can now be prevented by vaccines. Cervical cancer caused by the human papillomavirus, the HPV, is also, we also developed a vaccine for that, and recently in the last couple of years there's been a lot of propaganda to have uh, all young women, including adolescents, receive this vaccine, and even for some men to have. And then, finally, gastric and duodenal also, a very common problem in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, thought to be due to stress and environmental factors, but in actuality are caused by the Helicobacter pylori bacteria. And this can be really, uh, also can be treated with antibiotics. We used to use antacids and all kinds of things to combat the acidity of the stomach and treat them with the psychology and psychiatry, but it really turned out to be an infection. All of the major advances in understanding, treating, and controlling infectious disease have occurred in the last 200 years. The breakthroughs in the prevention, treatment, control, elimination, and potential eradication are among the most important advances in the history of medicine. And finally, I'd like to turn the page over. And even though our forebears and ancestors didn't know anything about microscopes and bacteria or antibiotics, they weren't so dumb after all. Ovid is a Latin poet and scholar from 43 BC, from 43 BC to 1780. He said, what timid man does not avoid contact with the sick, fearing lest he contract a disease so near? I guess a juvenile, and another Roman, said, this plague has come upon us by infection, and it will spread still further. Just as in the fields, the scab of one sheep or the mange of one pig destroys the entire herd. He was talking about anthrax here. And then for Corrine's sake, Shakespeare, 1564-1616, the searchers of the town, suspecting that we were both in a house where the infectious pestilence did reign, sealed up the doors and would not let us forth. That's Romeo and Juliet. And finally, in the bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine, the dirty cook gives diarrhea quicker than rhubarb. Every time we have rhubarb pie, I mention to our table companions that rhubarb is a great laxative. Great what? Laxative. In fact, uh, in my day, in the early days, they took rhubarb and made an extract out of it and made it into pills. And you could buy rhubarb pills just like you bought excellent. All right, now, Ralph. How can you tell, how can you measure if you have a good immune system? Uh, you can't. You can't. I mean, you, the, the, the best thing about measuring your immune system is that you don't get sick. And you don't, you're, you're not susceptible. There are some people who are susceptible to colds. There are some people that are susceptible to, to viruses and other people are not. And there is no measurement of that that I can tell you, laboratory-wise or other. 
I could spend a, another lecture talking about the diseases of the immune system because they run, in, they run from, from arthritic problems to blood problems to kidney and liver problems. And all kinds of things occur when your immune system gets out of kilter. And we don't know uh, a lot about that, why that's so, or even what to do for it. The major treatment for that is cortisol or cortisone derivatives. But I think that you can protect yourself by simple sanitary hygiene methods against now we're talking infectious disease. You can protect yourself with simple measures, hand washing, hand disinfectant, avoiding sick people, not coughing or sneezing on somebody or on what you're dealing with. Washing your hands after you play a game of bridge because everybody's handled the cards. Uh, simple things like that. And, and you just avoid, as I said, infection is passed from one person to another. <coughs> if you don't come in contact, you're not likely to get the problem. If everybody has the problem, everybody will be in contact. And we live in a community where I think if you have a respiratory problem of any kind, I think you should stay home. Get your food delivered. Does heredity have anything to do with it? Uh, heredity has to do with, like everything else, heredity has to do with inheriting with the immune system. And as I said, there are all kinds of defects and defaults with the immune system. And it, but a lot of problems in every field run in the family. We went down this today for macular degeneration. It runs in the family, the lady said. And, and well, so many things do. So I think uh, it's, it's always good to know what's going on in the past in your family. And always good to tell the doctor if you have symptoms that you think might be related to something one of your family members has had. Particularly when you're talking about a chronic disease. Diabetes, oh boy, it runs in the family. Everybody's got it. I've told you before, give me a 25-year-old lady with a 10-pound baby and I'll give you diabetes at 50. And she comes in at 50 and says, when did I get it? You got it the day you were born. <laughs> but back in the 70s, they treated hepatitis. They gave us gammaglobulin in the shop. Do they have a vaccine for it now? Yes, they have a vaccine for it now. Gammaglobulin was the best we had at the time. And even that didn't do much. No. What do you think about Botox? Isn't that the same source as botulism? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's Isn't awesome. that really scary? Uh, it's, it's like, what was I going to say? The anthrax bacteria, it's not the bacteria that kills you. It's that there are two toxins released by the bacteria that kill you. And the same thing applies. But the Botox is a toxin, and it has certain effects. Well, Botox is a toxin? Yeah. Botox is a toxin. Yeah. 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 It's a it's a product from botulism. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in botulism. Now people still think you catch a cold by a cold draft. That isn't true at all. You it? don't catch a cold by a cold draft. You don't catch a cold by being wet. If you catch a cold by being in contact with somebody who has it. Right. <laughs> Unless you're typhoid Mary, oh. and you're carrying your cold virus around all the time, but you're not sick, and all of a sudden something happens and you break down and you're sick. Something. Like Whoops. <laughs> Don't do that. That's quite a heart you have there. <laughs> yeah. Play us a tune. Okay. Any more? More? Any more? Come on. Okay. Uh, do they have any idea of how the virus is contained in people who are just carriers? Uh, it, it, viruses live in the cells. I can't hear you. Viruses live in the cells. Okay. It could be in the cells of your nasal pharynx, the cells of your lungs. Cells. Anyway, cells are something that get billions and billions of cells. Yeah. 
we, we have viruses and microorganisms in us that are not toxic. Of course. And they're good. Oh, yes. You couldn't survive from a digestive yeah. point of view if you didn't have bacteria in your intestinal yeah. tract. No. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I lost my spleen you know, about three years ago. Yes. And they used to pick up everything I walked by. No, no, I don't, I disagree with that. Lost the, your what? The, the, the spleen. The spleen is an organ that takes old age red blood cells, <coughs> breaks them down, and sends the vital parts back into the circulation to make, to the bone marrow to make new red cells. It has no other effect that I know about that would make you amenable. I would never tell a person because they had their spleen out, you're going to get all kinds of infections. I don't think that's true. The current um, um, research doesn't really show any relationship between autism and immunization, does it? No, it doesn't. It does not. That was propagated by an English physician, and that's been shown, at least, it, it, you know, these things are awfully hard to prove or disprove. But the consensus is that the immunizations have absolutely nothing to do with it. And not only that, but they are now picking up autism in children before they've been uh, immunized. So, uh, and then again, what is autism? Autism is just like everything else. It's not one thing. It's a wastebasket full of things. It's just like I talked to you about breast cancer. It isn't breast cancer. There are at least six different kinds of breast cancer. An article in last week's New England Journal of Medicine. They took people who had cancer, malignancies, that had metastasized to four to foreign places. I said they had breast cancer that went to bone or liver or lung. And they took pieces of the, multiple pieces of this breast cancer and they did genomic studies on them. And they found out that the molecules are mutating within these metastatic, metastatic masses, quite different from the biopsy they took out of the primary mass. So that's why this drug Avastin works in some people with breast cancer but doesn't work in others because they don't have the same kind of molecular structure. And there are at least six different kinds of breast cancer now. So uh, we're just getting into this uh, genome thing, that's a genetic pattern. Uh, it costs $10,000 to get your self analyzed. When it gets down to $100, maybe it'll be worthwhile. But they're finding terrible complications in these metastatic cancer masses that were not present in the primary mass and it throws all the therapy out the window. It makes it very, very difficult. And that was in the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal. If you travel to foreign to these third world countries, should you get polio vaccine? Should you be able? No, I wouldn't get polio vaccine, no. Uh, again, I don't think the risk would be very high, particularly if you're, if, if you're going to go to the foreign country and you're going to trek in the Himalayas or up into China by yourself in a backpack, I think you ought to get treated, vaccinated with everything that's available. But if you're going on a tour, with, you know, a guided tour like most of us would do, particularly at our age, I don't think that's necessary. But there are some places and again, in your travel agent to tell you where you should get yellow fever. Again, depending on where you're going. And you still shouldn't drink the water in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. That's it. Uh, the trouble with that is the, the bottle of water might be bottled yeah, from right. the tap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Hey, you, you know about the vaccinations yeah. and the travel. How is it about HIV that made it known to us only in the recent past? Can't answer that. No, no, I don't know whether. Maybe, maybe it was a, a virus which mutated and became uh, a virulent in this manner. Do we know that this existed 100 years ago? I don't know that. I don't think so. But I don't know that. 
But I do know that and there was a nice article in the Wall Street Journal again about these people who have been treated with for HIV and AIDS for, for 15, 20 years, who are 50, their bodies are like they're 70 or 80. They're having premature aging. Mm -hmm. And they don't know whether it's the medicine or the disease or what it is. They're getting all kinds of chronic they, they, aging problems where their uh, chronological age said they shouldn't have that at that time. Well, they haven't died, but they're not well. Yeah, they haven't died, but they're not well, but they're not going to live as the beer. That's right. Yes. All right. <clears throat> I had uh, severe chicken pox when I was in the Navy. Yeah, I and know. I decided to take part in a shingle study mm -hmm. for 10 years, and mm -hmm. they gave me a free shot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, so far. I haven't had the shingles. Yeah, chicken pox in an adult is a serious, serious disease. I was disease. pretty sick. And a lot, a lot of mortality there in an adult. What is the reason that the adult, uh, the adult going to childhood disease like mumps is so serious? I can't, I can't answer that except to tell you that it is. Okay. And, yeah. and I know that from experience. When I was in Bethesda Naval Hospital, we had a whole bunch of people, with, especially the men with mumps. Well, you know, they yeah. were terribly sick. Most of them became impotent. So, uh, yeah. Well, and shingles more than once. Do you still need to take those shingles, John? I can't, I can't answer that. I went through, I've talked with, about shingles here before. The only thing I can say about the shingles vaccine is it is not 100% effective. There's a significant number of people who have the vaccine who again get the shingles. But the greater proportion of people who got the vaccine didn't get the shingles. So it's, no, like right. this. And, and, uh, so that's true of a lot of, it, of immunizations, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think so. I, think, I don't think anything's 100%. Yeah. Well, people still think shingles can be contagious. Can't no. I, what? No, it's not contagious. I, I, said, I said it before. I have never seen a spouse whose partner had the shingles develop the shingles. It is not contagious person to person. If you haven't had the chicken box in childhood, you're not going to get this, the shingles. And it would be highly unusual if a person came down with chicken box and simultaneously, coincidentally, their partner came down with it. It's just a statistically thing that is, is way out of bounds. I don't know. Okay, fine. I'm open, I'm open to topics for future talks. As I've said a hundred times before, we'd be glad to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm not a good one. 